Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to Stack Talk. Um, so the first topic is uh, supposed to be presented by Dominic, so I think we'll skip it and maybe uh, if he's here, uh, leave it for the end of the meeting. Uh, so the second, yeah. yes, that's it. Uh, second topic is from Pep uh, about handling packages that can be analyzed, uh, like local file or Git. So Pep, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Um, yes, the context uh, for this is recent efforts to help some people uh, use um, project auth and repos that have pip, existing pip files that contain local uh, editable installs and pointers to packages that are hosted as a file instead of hosted as a in a in a package index so the topic is about how can we best um, help those people and yeah basically this and i i have two two sub points or two uh suggestions one is about documenting what's happening why you know currently if you try to do this get ahead will create an issue that looks like scary and, and you know, something's wrong. If you do it from Tamos, it throws an error, but it's it's unclear, maybe potentially unclear to someone trying to use that for the first time to understand what's going on. So the first thing I believe we need to do is to document this, uh, explain what's happening, why it is happening, what are the alternatives, and why do we believe that this is not a good practice or, you know, actually the topic to discuss here is what should we document or how, what angle should we take tackle here? The other point though is th this was discussed in a, I think it was a scrum yesterday ab about potentially creating a feature request to Tamos or maybe, well, this, this has to go back to the API, et cetera, but the potential to include uh, an option to ignore or skip dependencies that we don't know about and provide, let's say, a partial recommendation and, and let the user assume the conse consequences of this. So that's what I wanted to bring to the table. Uh, and and this, this came, this feature request was mentioned by at least uh, someone in the data science group that you know they said um, that it would help adoption uh, let's see um i wonder about the do what i mean feature or the i know what i'm doing feature um is it is it is it that we remove everything that is uh, local, that is um, editable, or that is from from the local file system or so? Or how, because that feels like, well, we are heavily influencing the whole dependency graph. And in the end, we cannot even tell if we have generated an uh, and partial advice because we well obviously it's a it's a partial advice um, but uh, we cannot even tell what the quality of that advice uh, would be it could be complete crap i guess so th that feels a little bit dangerous uh, somehow that is why i would um i think i would prefer that the least but um i don't know um exactly what it means to exclude all these these uh, things um frida or maya or any advice person um i think it will in the best case generate random results right so uh, i don't think uh skipping dependencies in uh requirements files is a good idea because uh they were stated in these requirements and it means 
people are using them. So uh, that's that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, editable installations were not very welcomed in, in the community. And if you take a look at uh, standardization in uh, the Python packaging ecosystem, it was uh, there were a lot of concerns about it and, and rejections. And uh, especially in resolvers as, as thought, uh, I don't think it makes sense to, to support editable installations. Uh, rather be explicit about uh, that uh, editable installations, either from local file or Git, uh, shouldn't be uh, supported. Like explicit that uh, the system doesn't support it. The reason behind that is uh, that uh, the system does not know um, what to install from local file system or from, from Git, and it's not feasible to analyze every Git commit or every file on, on disk, uh, but rather have thought as that authority that knows here is source of packages, meaning uh, Python package index. Uh, it can be PyPI, but it can be also corporate index or it can be your internal company index uh, that you, you deploy. And this is the instance that hosts all the packages. And in that case, Todd can resolve these packages and you know that they are analyzed. Uh, they are, let's say, went through some uh, process. Uh, so you know that they are uh, released properly, can go to uh, products and things like that, right? And Todd uh, monitors these indices and can give you information on which packages uh, you should consume. I understand that, um, for example, in that uh, notebooks uh, that are published, uh, it might be not, let's say, nice to, to tell people that they should not use editable installations. But in general, it's best practice. And uh, if you really want to consume packages that uh, are uh, monitored, that uh, are uh, checked for, for security vulnerabilities and can really say this is the trusted content, then you need to host it somewhere, uh, make sure that it went through a release process and Todd can guide you on, on these packages. So, one okay. I, I believe that uh, I understand what what you said, and all of this I believe should be. It's exactly the type of thing that I was thinking to add to the documentation and explain this and make it part of the top documentation to let people understand how things should work. But then the thing is that the reality <laughs> is that uh, many people are not doing it, and I mean. Or at least, I mean, from from limited talking to people, but for about editable installs in particular, there is kind of a use case that they, they explain that kind of makes sense as well. Like, okay, what if I only have a couple of, it's not not even a module, a couple of Python files with shared code across multiple notebooks that is not worth creating a, a package for because it's like just i don't know helper code if you want just to reuse some some code but i need it i need to use that bit in three four notebooks in the same repo and therefore i just create a basically like creating a sim link automatically so to speak where mm -hmm. the burden of of creating a package for this is significantly high compared to i mean it's an overhead so that's one use case sorry uh to, to finish the other the other use case i heard about is um from the same repo actually it's an upstream package that provides there is a pypy version of the package but it's a source distribution and they provide binary builds as well but out of you know they they have a 
table of you know combination of dependencies, blah blah blah, where you, they point you to a wheel that you download as a file. So people actually might prefer to go to the pre-built binaries instead of, um, and they are not hosted to in, in the package index. I think both uh, both use cases are very valid, right? Um, the first one seems to be like a Jupyter Hub problem or a Jupyter Notebook problem, uh, a general Jupyter Notebook problem, because it doesn't seem so far catch that I have common code in a Python file that I use in, in multiple notebooks. So I I guess there should be a solution for that from the Python, uh, sorry, from the Jupyter community, right? That's that's case for for packaging. Uh, like we have bots that automate uh, packaging, and if you find uh, sources like code that is reused uh, multiple times, the best practice is to package it, have proper versioning, and Agreed. have it released. So uh, you make sure that if there's a bug or security issue, uh, the all all affected components uh, get yes. that. Uh, I absolutely agree. That, that is, uh, as I understood, the second use case uh, that uh, Pep talked about. Uh, let's let's create a let's have a very easy to use way to create Python modules because that's the recommended best practice. Um, so the barrier seems to be too high. Uh, let's try to lower it. But what if I just have like a common dot pi, and I use it in three different notebooks? I understood that is the the first use case where I just have like one file that has a, I don't know normalized IPv6 address or something like that, and I use it in multiple notebooks. That doesn't seem to me like a like a like a package, at least not in in Python universe. In Node.js, they're gonna create that package for sure, but I think Python is a little bit different. Isn't there? Um, so I'm I'm staring out the window. There's a quite heavy thunderstorm coming in. That's why I'm a little afraid. I'm afraid of nature. Um, isn't there a best practice, or shall we research if there's a best practice in in uh, Jupyter notebooks how to use these common dot pi that I have as as a single file with not that many things? Is it uh, is it living in the same Git repository? Uh, yes, what I heard so, though yeah. is that because we we mentioned a p potential solution, this was in the context of uh, notebooks that are in the same repo indeed, and they are uh, run uh, in the repo gets uh, spawned into a Jupyter Hub hosted in container and and. The solution we proposed was why don't you set Python path at runtime to point to your local funds? And the answer was, well, that works for the notebooks, but not for the pipelines. They later turn this set of notebooks into a pipeline that executes them. Um, and you cannot set Python path uh, there. Then there is an, oh. another hack about. Wait, wait, wait. Th that's a packaging problem, right? Because it, yes, if... but again, I, I know we could find a solution, uh, and we could, because it's a container image, we could trust that this path we can modify it more or less reliably. But again, it's about lowering the, the, the making it easy um, to get on board. Let's see. It, fe it feels to me like um, we need to find some some common good uh, practice for that one, right? And it feels to me it's it's not really a tough uh, problem here uh, because we are talking about um, creating Python modules, which is not a problem uh, in our domain, or which is a more general problem. And we are talking about uh, reusing uh, shared code or common code in multiple notebooks or in multiple deployments, like a workflow, uh, like a Kubeflow um, pipeline. Um, so uh, I wonder. Uh, it, it, yeah. Uh, it might be good to adjust this path uh, in each uh, no notebook in the 
repository that uses that uh, shared uh, notebook uh, on source code level, right? So you, you say syspath and uh, append uh, where it should uh, be living. That's a uh, hack within Git repository. If, if you use, let's say, common uh, script with all the all the uh, common functions, that's that's first hack, and I think that's that's the best hack uh, that you can do. The second hack is, uh, I think we we discussed it with uh, Trey or Anand uh, that was adjusting Python path in build pipelines. I think that's not a good idea because it breaks uh, or adjusts default import system uh, when you import Python modules and it applies to all the code, right? That uh, is produced by build pipelines. And then it means you are shifting away from default configuration uh, and it might produce some uh, undesired behavior when you have uh, Python files uh on your on your disk right and the third option that's uh i think uh the best option when you have uh, common logic uh create uh one repository package it uh we should provide uh easy to package solution and deploy and uh host that uh, common logic and in that case uh you can spread uh this common logic across multiple repositories and it's the purpose of, of uh, packaging. So I think they're using syspath. If you have multiple uh, notebooks in one repository and you have shared. Yeah, let's let's write that up. Um, um, uh, Guillaume is uh, insisting data scientists have no skill, or I, maybe I read over the chat too fast, um, but um, it feels like really creating that module is uh, the, the least preferred um, path from the uh, data science point of view. Um, let's explore a little bit. Let's document these um, alternatives uh, that we have, these options, and let's feedback. I'm pretty sure the people in the Lyra community, like um, like Romeo, they they also have an opinion on that on how how to use common code segments. Whoa, Fredo seems to be a little bit frozen. Let's see if he comes back. Is it is it good uh, for you, Pep? Um. For me, yes, but I'm not the data scientist going to use. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, and, right, right. And I'm putting my hat off, you know, trying to play the the role of the. I mean, and I'm not pro probably not qualified to, about this, but what I heard so far is we're not going to do that, <laughs> or this is maybe too much for for what we have. Like the example you mentioned, th th there are. Two situations. Maybe one is like a lot of shared code that you know to to make the notebooks lighter and and just put the <clears throat> the shiny parts in the keep the shiny parts in the notebook and and the heavy lifting in shared code. That might be probably more. You could justify better to you know turn this into a package maybe, but still I would. I would assume there would be some resistance because you know it has been working forever. But then the other case is the one that you mentioned, uh, Christoph, like common.py, where I have like just common initialization to you know get the credentials to connect to somewhere and like a few lines of, of code that set some variables and, and get them you know from the environment and set things up for everything else to work. And that's probably less prone to, or you could justify less making a package out of it because it's... Yeah. Let, let's document it and um, travel the communities. If they say we absolutely don't understand why we should create modules, what shall I say? I'm I'm not the Catholic church. I'm, I'm not going to raise my flaming sword and uh, tell them. Um, but I think we have very good reasons why it is uh, a good idea to 
adopt a little bit the software engineering uh, practices and, and really do that um, little bit more effort of creating a module. Let's document these a few um, points. I think um, um, it's, for me it's tricky because I see both sides, right? I'd like to have the uh, data scientist just do the work in a nice and easy way, just click and clack and do, go. Um, but at the same time, we should uh, keep in mind um, that we want to have. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. I'm scared. Yeah, okay. there was like a, a click clock. <laughs> okay. I believe documenting is the very minimum we can do, and then, but at least also I would say the errors that we are throwing now. Uh, I would once we have the documentation, make them make the errors a bit more friendly by pointing just to to an explanation. Yes, exactly. And about the feature request, is this something we want to explore a bit more or not? Should we create an issue to review it in uh, more detail? Yes, Let, let's create that feature request because I think part of the document that we were talking about will answer that feature request and we're going to close it. Okay. But, but, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah but, but it's a good way to document that stuff, right? Why, why don't we have that force mm -hmm. that do what I want? The way I understand it, uh, if you correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the reason why you, you wouldn't want a partial resolution is because the outcome of uh, Thomas advice or whatever should be a pip file dot block that actually satisfies your dependencies. Uh, so meaning that you do uh, it install and run and it installs all the dependencies and, and the thing runs. And if you skip some dependencies, you will end up with a partial pip file log that it will install only a subset of your dependencies, and when you run your application, it will not work. So that's kind of uh, than having and, a, a sub package, though, because because it, having that that source is the same as just having a, a sim link in your in your project, and there's there's no difference. It's like saying we can't uh, resolve like some sub package that you have in your project. It, it should still be a valid resolution. It just doesn't consider some of the source code. Frida, I think you're muted and trying to talk. Maybe. Now, yes. Yes. So imagine that you have, uh, so uh, imagine you have requirements uh, takes them and do use with, with pip and in this file you state your requirements. Now when you perform or call pip install dash r requirements txt pip's uh, resolution logic takes that input that these are requirements of your application. Uh, did you stated that these need to be satisfied in order to run your application? Uh, PIP resolves application dependencies and provides you all the dependencies and installs uh, them to your, to your environment. If it cannot satisfy one dependency, that means uh, it cannot satisfy your requirements to run the application or to install that application correctly. And in that case, uh, it cannot just say, uh, I installed all of them, I just keep it flask because why uh, you need you stated flask or you or it's one of your dependencies and it is required to run your application if it cannot install or cannot resolve flask for whatever reason that means that application will not run right uh, because it doesn't meet your requirements and it's the same as uh, these editable installations so tots resolver is basically uh, resolver as pip but uh, if, the problem mm -hmm. if, if we have if we have require users to basically uh, state all transitive dependencies of like any editable installations then it avoids the problem so if, if we just make it clear that like to have an editable install you need to define 
the the transitive dependencies of the local installation. Uh, say it again, uh, probably. So, like, like if I have requirements inside my edit will install, um, of course, we're not going to see know what those are from Thoth. But if we basically require the user to define any um, of those requirements in the actual pip file, then it would come up with a valid resolution because you can just add the original package back at the end. Uh, from you mean uh, populating uh, requirements from editable installation to to be filed? Yeah, uh, that would work. But uh, also uh, that editable uh, needs to be present or needs to be installed into environment. Like when you say this is an editable package in pip, it installs all its dependencies and that package. In case of tot, we cannot. Uh, resolve it uh, and cannot uh, install or say that that code is, is safe and good to run because we don't have control over it. And that's that's the value add of TOT instead of PIP, right? Because TOT uh, controls all the software, all your, your dependencies. And in that case, they are analyzed and they are placed somewhere. So that's why I, 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 that's why I named the, the, the feature request here. I know what I'm doing because uh, uh, it, it it assumes like it delegates uh, responsibility about making sure that this is safe to run, etc., to the user. And as, as part of it is, as Kevin said, the responsibility to make sure that your you list all the transitive dependencies. One second, Christoph, and <laughs> and and then uh, you know the request would be okay tolerate this and add, you know, this installing the package, like basically the editable install version is create a same link to it. And it's up to you that if this breaks things or it doesn't work, I know what I'm doing. Well, then if it breaks, yeah, it's, but, you but know what you just, it. what you just created, right? You, you, you traverse the whole dependency graph. You put all these transitive dependencies that originate from the one editable package. You put all the ones in that whole subgraph, excluding the editable package, into the requirements or in the pip file. And then you told a service which is supposed to help you, I know what I'm doing. That sounds to me like don't use our service because you know what you are doing anyways. So how much of help yeah, it's, could we be? It is meant to be, and I know I understand your point, but I know what I'm doing includes, I know I'm not receiving full advice uh, or I'm, I know I'm not using the service properly, but uh, it's kind of, a, um, you know, that repo that we had in mind has, I don't know, um, 20 direct dependencies or so. Um, and I don't know how many um, transit dependencies. And just a, a few files locally, like, you know, it's like, okay, if we assume that those files are just like, just common.py, um, as Guillaume said, boilerplate code to just set up the environment or something like nothing major. And everything else, you know, the the, the, in that sense, the advice, I know what I'm doing. I know that the advice would cover everything in my stack except just some boilerplate code that really doesn't and matter, right? That's not secure an environment. You know what, what you are doing, but it's uh, bad practice and it's not secure environment. Uh, in that case, don't use TOT. Uh, the responsibility of TOT is to do DevSecOps. So follow good practices and uh, make sure that your application runs in compliance to these, these practices. OK, fair enough. Mm, yeah. Yeah, if I may, and I will try to talk. Um, yes, but DevSecOps is not always about following exactly the rule because sometimes you know there is you know there's been a cve regarding something but you know of 
other means to protect you from this problem. Like, okay, I know there is a vulnerability in this specific package, but I know that anyway, this system is not accessible from outside. So that perf that's perfectly fine with the security policy of the company. So that's where sometimes yes, security is more about knowing exactly what you are doing in your specific context than, than following a very precise you know, package number or, or, or whatever. So uh, I totally agree with you, Frido. And I'm fully advocating for you should always respect that. But there is always the unless you know, you know better because there is always a context. So. Um, this uh, uh, this probably can uh, uh, open discussion to uh, say Todd, uh, like I want to have secure environment, but ignore this specific CVE because I'm aware of it and I'm not, and I know that uh, it does not influence uh, security of my application. Uh, even uh, that package version has that CVE and is flagged. Uh, let's ignore that CVE because I reviewed it and uh, I'm sure that it does not affect uh, production deployment. Uh, the point here is uh, about the code that uh, uh, environment uses. So if uh, you use some code that comes from editable installations somewhere from Git repository, then we don't know uh, what is inside, right? And we cannot uh, say uh, we are fine uh, with uh, using that code uh, because you know what you are doing. Uh, in that case, the developer is using some random, uh, not audited code from internet, from the internet, and uh, we cannot say it's safe. You know, we cannot say we don't know that there are that there are CVEs, but we don't know what that code is. It can be some uh, Bitcoin miner or something. Can you well, it there is a it should never sorry, say but... it's safe. It, it's safe. It should always say have a big warning. I have not been able to analyze this code. So for this part, you're on your own. But it's it's surely never safe, of course. I just wanted to say that it might not be a random GitHub code. It might be just my code. It's just like I have it. Locally, uh, right? Come yeah, on, it's, it's we, know, we, know, we, we, know, we know you got it on slash dot. Don't lie, like everyone. Yeah, yeah. I'll pretend it's mine. Sorry, Kevin. I, I was just saying it's the same way we can't offer security guarantees about a user's own code. Like, there, there's no way we can guarantee yeah. that they're doing something safe. Whether that is uh, something that we're gonna uh, not gonna do. Uh, that is very true. But I think um, it is different qualities, right? Um, if if I gonna run an advice and Toth tells me there is this and that CVE, or this and that community is not doing any CI for their code for their modules, or um, uh, fifty percent of your modules are not signed then I can make an educated decision if I like it or not. Um, but about the editable uh, modules, for example, or the shared code that's living inside the Git, uh, sorry, the notebook repository, we cannot make any statements. So what is the value of taking that in and saying, we don't know. Uh, it's not it's not delivering any value add um, to the user, uh, actually. If I gonna take the decision and say, yep, yeah, screw you, uh, CVEs are fine, and I don't care if somebody is quality checking his code, then it's at least my decision. Um, but I have hopefully made a good decision based on the information that we have provided. Um, I think that is the the, the general philosophy um, or the general um, uh, general difference in quality, right? If If I can't analyze it, I can't say anything. So that's not what you expect from me, that I can't say anything. What you expect from me is that I can tell you something about this stuff and you're going to make an educated decision. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, we could just warn about the bad practice and the not analyzed code. But then I wonder what the do what I mean or I know what I'm doing uh, option is for. 
No, the wording and to... bad practice would be the documentation part. So yes. document why it is bad practice and why it should be, and then the commands would point you to that document, RTFM and by. Sorry. Yes. yes. And if you are in a con controlled environment, such as, I don't know, some bank, you want to have control over your application dependencies, so they need to be properly released, they need to be properly uh, hosted, uh, they need to be properly analyzed by TOT. So when you are consuming them, you are sure that uh, they are consumed in a right way yes. and they, they are secure. Uh, by the way, that feature, like ignore this CVE because I'm aware of it, uh, could be could be good. Uh, it can be a uh, nice feature. Um, yes, um, that might be something that comes out of what uh, Maya and I discussed uh, this morning or brainstormed. Um, final comment to this one. Um, if we take it from a security policy enforcement point of view, and um, if we're gonna put an SBOM, a software bill of material, on every container image that we have created, and in that SBOM there is stated module ABZ is not analyzable, and Stackrox is figuring out, oh, the SBOM is incomplete, I'm not gonna run that software. We have not won anything. So I think, especially in, in very restricted environments, um, we, we should go with our, maybe from a data science point of view, pretty hardcore attitude and say everything should be in module, everything should be traceable, because that is how we're going to provide you security. Or if, if not uh, super secure, bug-free code, we at least give you all the uh, justifications to make an educated decision. So, and uh, bypass CVEs, I think uh, that should be true for for any uh, prescription, shouldn't it? So I should be able to say, well, CI, I don't care. If, if source, uh, sorry, if scorecard um, CI is giving me a lot of um, justifications in my advice, I simply don't care, ignore all of them. Is that, I mean, CVE is just a special case. This can be a nice, uh, nice flag. Maybe, maybe not ignore prescription and make it more generic because some uh, pipeline units do not work. Uh, or there are Python pipeline and it's not specific to prescriptions. Uh, but uh, you can, uh, the very first implementation can use labels. Uh, they are already propagated into the resolution process. And in that case, you can say uh, label ignore CVE uh, equals to CVE something. And the business logic of the resolver can easily speak. Uh, skip that CVE. So you can write it in the configuration file or you can uh, 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 pass it as an uh, option in the command line. Okay, I... I don't, <laughs> the risk of sounding interesting too much, but I'll keep playing devil's advocate. Can you explain me the difference? Uh, like I'm a user, new user trying to implement thought, and I see this shiny new feature you have, ignore error, blah. What's the difference between this and I know what I'm doing to you know, ignore my local files? Uh, in uh, so uh, you have properly set up your environment, and uh, Tot can guide you with respect to dependencies that you use. 
So it can tell you uh, these dependencies are valid resolution and you should use them. So there is no uh, hackish behavior when it comes to editable installations, right? Uh, having some code uh, pulled from a Git, a Git repository or, or somewhere else. So you have a properly packaged component as we have uh, components in, in Todd. Now you ask Todd for an advice and uh, Todd gives you some resolution. If you ask for a security advice, as Julian uh, stated, not all software is 100% CVE free. So if you take a look at, for example, TensorFlow, there are uh, a lot of uh, CVE vulnerabilities, but uh, you manually checked all of them and uh, your security policy or security department says uh, this uh, CVE does not affect our software because it's very specific to, I don't know, how you obtain data from uh, Google Cloud Storage and we don't use Google Cloud Storage, right? Uh, so it's okay if uh, that uh, package uh, with that CVE is included in the resolution process. Uh, so what you can do, you can state, I'm fine with that CVE because it went through uh, company policies and it's uh, marked as okay. I think the, the the one is blindfold and the other one is ignorance. If, if you are using that module from your company internal Git that um, your colleague created, you're basically blindfold you're, you're just using stuff that you really don't know anything about maybe he's a russian hacker maybe maybe she's from china you never know um but uh, ignoring cves is just ignorant you know what you're doing yes um it's exactly doing what you wanted to do it's working code and you're ignoring the the advice uh, that you, we gave you um i mean the professional domains it's a little bit uh better expressed by saying we had a risk analysis and we came up with a risk mitigation plan and blah, blah, blah. But that's well-educated ignorance, right? As, as Frido explained, um, if you're a bank and if you have low um, severity CVEs in a piece of code that is not used, you can basically put the CV on the positive list and accept that risk. Okay. Thanks for the discussion. Yes, uh, thanks for the discussion, exactly. <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, putting all that energy in, all, all of you. Okay, so is it all, all for this topic or anything else? Okay, so yes. I think we are over time. So do you want to go to the next topic or leave it for next time? Um, let's um let's uh, take it offline um maybe maybe we can scribble something up um because um i think maya you and i we we went from uh could be a nice topic for an intern to hey this is a great um way to get features or user experience from open data hub open data hub into into our system maybe we're going to take it for next time because it feels like it might take an half an hour to if you're good with that, or we could just scribble something up and uh, send it to the group. I, I don't care. I don't care. Okay, so we'll leave it for next time. So I think uh, Don Luke is not here, so that would be the last topic, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording. And thanks, everyone. Thank you.